Hi there, everyone. This is Sarah from Myosh. Welcome to our webinar today. Today's topic is navigating Victoria's new Environmental Protection Act the regulations and your obligations. Um, as with all our webinars, this is being recorded and we will create a video and a podcast for distribution later today. There'll be some links that I will share during the webinar. And before I introduce the presenter, I'm just going to kick off with a poll. Um, also, just a reminder, any questions and answers which we'll endeavour to answer at the end, please use the Q&A panel. If you want to um, chat directly to me or anyone, please use the chat panel. And here's the poll, first poll. So please join in and um, answer. There'll be a couple of polls later on as well. Um, hopefully you can see that poll. Um, so today's um, presenter is um, Peter Oxen. He's from the Green Cap Group. He's a principal consultant for environment at Green Cap. Peter has been working in the environmental industry for over 20 years, working across local government, consulting petroleum infrastructure projects and defence sites. Peter has led a number of major projects in both environmental site assessment and remediation sites across Australia. He's also currently part of the EP PA slash DELWP contaminated land stakeholder working group, subordinate legislation reform program for the development of new Victorian environmental regulations. Also the project managing EPA's small business pilot program for the VACC and Dry Cleaning Industry Association, which covers implementation of the new environmental legislation across motor vehicle workshops and commercial dry cleaners. So thanks for joining us. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Sarah. Really appreciate that uh, nice introduction and, and welcome folks to this session. Um, really hope you uh, get a lot out of today's uh, uh, information as well as uh, some opportunities to ask some questions at the back end of, of this presentation. Um, uh, as you're probably aware, this is a, a bit of a moving feast, uh, this, uh, this new legislation that's coming in. There's lots of information uh, from EPA coming through multiple uh, avenues, uh, be it through their, um, their website itself or through their own uh, uh, education and awareness uh, pieces that they've been doing. And, and they've been doing that for quite some time now, uh, working with a number of industry associations uh, to help get the information out there. So today really is just to help try and navigate some of that, that information that's coming in from lots of different angles. Um, even myself uh, working quite closely with EPA uh, in, in terms of that uh, small business pilot program and, and talking with, with businesses as well as being on the subordinate uh, working group for the, the legislation, et cetera, has been uh, still a very dynamic situation. So um, just as of last week, there was a, a new publication put out by the EPA in regards to contaminated land, which I'll talk to a little bit later on. Um, and the week before was, or a couple of weeks before that was, uh, was their intent uh, with regards to um, enforcement uh, for the new legislation. So there's lots of information that's coming out and there's still more information to come. I believe there's a, a publication that'll be coming out in regards to the duty to notify before the 1st of July as well. Um, so that's information that, uh, that I'm yet to see and, uh, and I guess we'll all be waiting with, uh, with bated breath in regards to that. So today I'll, I'll start off with just the basics uh, around what, um, what the new legislation actually is and what it means to every single Victorian um, and also businesses that, uh, that operate in, in Victoria. Um, so the new Environment Protection Act really basically is, it's a risk-based act um, and it's designed to mimic the, um, the previous uh, oh and uh, legislation, well, current and previous oh and legislation in regards to um, looking at prevention uh, rather than a cure, so to speak. And, uh, there's a big focus around uh, responsibilities for individuals and businesses uh, to understand their risks, understand their hazards associated with their business activities, um, and, uh, and, and, and look to putting controls in place that manage those risks to as low as reasonably practicable. So just on this slide here, um, if you look at the, the old legislation, which was way back in 1970, which is one of the first uh, environment legislations around the world. I think America was the first back in 1968 or 69. Um, we came out a year later. So we were really quite ahead of the game there, but it is it is old legislation. There's been a number of updates, et cetera, to, to that legislation. Um, and that was really around consequence based. So if you had an incident, um, they could ping you. Um, but uh, in terms of if you hadn't had an incident, they really couldn't um, look to enforce 
requirements around uh, around the, the legislation. So um, the new legislation really is about, okay, well, do you understand your hazards and have you got controls around those hazards and risks? And if you don't, you don't necessarily have to have an impact. Um, they can still, the EPA can still look to enforce requirements of you uh, to ensure that uh, they're, you're minim mitigating uh, impact to the environment and human health. So I've talked through that a little bit. Um, now, in terms of the uh, legislation itself and this overarching duty, it is proportionate. And I think that's a really important um, term to take away from today's session. Um, proportionality is something that EPA are very keen to pursue. Um, they've obviously got limited resources themselves, although they are employing a lot more people and putting a lot more uh, funding into this uh, you know, enforcement of the new legislation and obviously development of the new leg uh, legislation and education. Um, but there, there is a proportionality aspect to it. And um, if you do have a chance to, I, I'd highly recommend that you read that, um, that, uh, that's, that statement of intent that EPA put out a few weeks ago, because it does talk about um, the different levels of, uh, of, I guess, their interests in businesses. So if you're a small business versus a large business, um, there will be a proportionate response in regards to that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it doesn't absolve people from responsibility, but the intent really is to make sure that those businesses that have got the resources um, <clears throat> and the size and scale around operation within Victoria, um, they're the ones who will really have that extra level uh, of requirement to, to make sure that they've really got everything under control um, at, versus a small mum and dad business uh, who don't quite have the same resources. The, the, the duties are still there, um, but in terms of the proportionality response, EPI are very clear that, um, that there will be different levels there. So that in itself is interesting. Um, and I guess in, in terms of what that actually means, um, you can look at, uh, for example, you know, some basic activities on a site may only require you know, simple risk assessment uh, based tools. And if that's, you know, you're a small operator working on, for example, a greenfield site, um, Greenfields being you know, a site that doesn't have a lot of contamination, there may just be a requirement there in regards to some simple controls to, to manage the hazards. Uh, and for example, on this one on the right hand side there, you can see the silt trap. And so that could just be a matter of having that conversation during a toolbox and documenting that during a toolbox talk. Um, for more complex site, more complex businesses, um, you know, there, there may be a requirement there for an EMP that could be quite a useful tool to have. To manage, uh, to manage your risks, identify the hazards and then put the controls in place. And then for larger businesses, having that environmental management system in place uh, is very beneficial as a basis for all business to, to understand at a, at a high level what the requirements are. And that can be uh, cascaded down into the operational level at, uh, you know, within different facets of the business. So that's, that's really important to understand that proportionality piece that you know, the duty is for everyone. Um, but there is a proportionality in regards to the, the level of potential impact of your business operations. One other key aspect, and this really does mimic the OHS Act and the way that WorkSafe operate, uh, you know, EPA really strong, uh, strongly advising that they want to uh, yeah, really mimic uh, the way that the WorkSafe guys operate, um, and that is ensuring that people who are out there in the business working around uh, hazards for the environment and to human health, that there is adequate training. So it's all very well to have an environmental management system, uh, but as we know, sometimes the best management systems uh, that have been drawn up can be a document that sits on the shelf and collects dust. Uh, what EPA are really looking for is to, for those documents to be uh, living documents and that evidence of that is, is very clear uh, through uh, the training of staff, uh, and that is, a, is an absolute requirement, just like with the, with the uh, OH&S Act. Um, so, you know, in terms of uh, the way people deliver that training, that's obviously uh, individual uh, businesses, but just having that um, yeah, uh, documentation to indicate that staff have been trained and some evidence uh, when uh, enforcement officers, uh, or authorised officers, I should say, come out and visit your sites. The other key aspect too is in regards to monitoring controls. So 
that really comes down to the those documents such as environmental management systems and EMPs living in the business. Um, and so where conditions can change on a daily basis uh, within a day or a week or month or, or year, um, that those uh, changes are considered and, uh, and any adjustment to hazard identification, risk levels are incorporated, uh, considered, documented, um, and, then, uh, and then actioned. And I'll just spin back to that, that wheel here, as you can see on the right hand side over here. Um, it's, uh, it, it's very, very clear, very standard sort of management control uh, wheel there, uh, where you're checking controls after you've identified the hazards, assessing the risks and implementing the controls. So this is a big one for this new legislation, notification and the requirements of notification uh, to the EPA. And really this one, um, in simple terms, there is a requirement if you do have a pollution event that it uh, threatens harm to human health or the environment. Uh, and uh, I've got a bit of an example over here on the right hand side with this image where uh, this activity has implemented some controls around sediment. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, those controls have failed. And uh, so there has been some fit, you know, effort to, to do that uh, hazard identification, risk assessment and, uh, and control in place. However, circumstances have occurred that, uh, that the, the control itself wasn't able to handle the, the, uh, the particular event here. In this case, uh, the sediments run off and, uh, and if it's gone into the local creek, um, that is, uh, potentially causing a risk of harm. So the notification would be there to EPA to identify that, that that's an issue. The other important one to, other duty to really recognise uh, under, the, under the Act is this uh, requirement to respond to pollution, uh, you know, re requirement to respond to a pollution incident. And this is not just the initial response where it's, uh, controlling, containing and communicating the three C's around um, a pollution event. The communication to the EPA in terms of notification is great initially, but there is gonna be a requirement there to follow through and, uh, and make sure that this incident is cleaned up um, to the extent practicable. And that includes neighboring sites as well. Um, so in this particular case on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a, a, an oil um, spill that's occurred and that oil spill has actually uh, gone off, you can't see it, it's the left hand side, but it's gone off site. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's potentially residual impact that's occurred um, into both the soil and groundwater. Um, and then there's a responsibility there for, for those persons to, um, to, to clean that up um, to the extent practicable. So there's a number of other aspects as well under the environment legislation, noise, vibration, sediment control, erosion and dust, uh, very important aspects um, around general operations uh, for businesses, particularly working in and around sensitive uh, you know, land uses. Um, the GED applies to this and that the GED really is around, uh, as I said earlier, uh, mitigating risks and the, the, the core, requirement for EPA is to, to mitigate risk. They do put in there that they want to do it to as low as reasonably practicable. And there's definition around what low and reasonably practicable is. They've actually put out a document, another publication around that. So uh, for those who think it might be a bit of a gray area, which in includes myself, um, they have, uh, EPA have gone to quite an extent uh, in terms of the definition of what uh, reasonably practicable means, which is actually really beneficial uh, for all, all and sundry. Um, to get your head around that, particularly in communicating uh, with um, with senior management within within businesses, uh, we've got a range of different uh, aspects to consider, uh, not just the environment. Um, erosion, dust, and sediment. Again, uh, you know this is a key one for GED to apply. Um, you know we've we've got the current uh, state environment protection policies that are out there. Uh, we'll have new reference standards, ERSs, environmental reference standards. Those previous uh, environment, um, state environment protection policies will be used as reference documents. Um, they won't be enforced as law, but certainly will be used as reference documents moving forward. Uh, 
um, and the new ERSs will come into play. But um, the example I've provided over there on the right-hand side is that if you're working in and around a, a, a business operation where you're generating uh, dust, um, then it is your responsibility uh, to minimise the risk of harm. And uh, in that case, really, the EPA expects you to mitigate it uh, uh, entirely where, where, it's, where it's practicable. So other uh, impacts of pollution and waste, chemical handling is, is another key one. Um, we do, and like most jurisdictions, there are uh, requirements under the OHS Act and the Dangerous Goods Act uh, to manage chemicals. And uh, sometimes there's, there's not always clear uh, integration between um, the environment requirements as well as the dangerous goods handling and chemical handling requirements under the OHS Act and Dangerous Goods Act. Um, the GED really is that link. And uh, you know, those requirements under the OHS Act around uh, safely managing chemicals uh, really well link into this uh, general environmental duty uh, to mitigate risk of harm to human health and the environment. Um, so it really is the responsibility under that GED uh, to effectively avoid leaking um, and, and hence causing harm, whether it be um, you know, leaking, for example, from drums here on the right-hand side, or whether it's you know, through a fire, which I've shown down the bottom there, that's some waste tires that have been stockpiled up. Um, so there is a requirement there to ensure that you're managing those, uh, those chemicals or waste so that uh, you're not potentially going to cause a problem. And uh, you know, we've seen in Victoria some fairly significant fires at Coolaroo, et cetera, where there's been build up of waste, et cetera, that has caused some significant impacts, not only to on-site users, but also to the surrounding community. Um, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about this, this waste effort uh, moving forward. Um, EPA has got a massive uh, focus on that waste area. It's probably one of the key areas for the, the new legislation. And um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, businesses and, uh, and their consideration around risks, um, the requirement to think about not only risks on site, but also the risks off site are going to be uh, extremely important to, to satisfy and discharge your duties under the Act. So contaminated land, uh, contaminated land is, is also a major area of change for uh, this for the state of Victoria and the legislation. And even just this morning myself, I was reading through some of the, the new material that's come out from EPA in the last week and uh, the expectations around management of contaminated land. Um, the, there's been varying levels of, of uh, management practices around contaminated land over the years, uh, depending on the business and the, the conscience uh, of business around uh, risks, et cetera. Um, the EPA, now put forward a very clear position around management uh, of, of uh, contaminated land. Um, that's both for on-site and for off-site. And like every single duty under the, under the Act, it's always umbrellaed by the general environmental duty. So whenever you, whenever there's a question mark, oh, does this duty, you know, what does it actually mean? There's always a really good opportunity to step back and go, okay, does this satisfy the general environmental duty? Um, and it's always a really good way to be able to communicate uh, to, to people who may be looking at some of the nitty gritty, uh, always step back and go, does this really satisfy, you know, the red face test around um, the general environmental duty, which is to, to minimise risks of, human heart, uh, of harm to human health and the environment. Specifically for managing contaminated land, there's sections in the Act that I think uh, are really pertinent uh, to those who, who have contaminated land. Um, one of them is around uh, you know or you should know um, about contaminated land. And this is something that uh, EPA uh, are really focusing on, on those persons who perhaps uh, were happy to, uh, for want of a term, better term, bury their head in the sand. And look, if I haven't done any testing, I don't know about the contamination, so it's not a problem. Um, that no longer applies. Uh, because if you are in uh, management or control of the land and there is reasonable grounds and a state of knowledge uh, 
uh, around your premises that could lead to some form of contamination and you haven't done an investigation to understand that. Um, uh, and there is an issue of site, uh, for example, a more sensitive use next door and they identify contamination um, that's likely to have come from your property. It's not good enough to have said, oh, look, I didn't do any testing, I didn't know about it. Um, the expectation from the EPA is that, that you have an understanding of what you're sitting on. Um, so you know, or you should know what that contamination is. And that, that is a significant change uh, for Victoria um, and si significant change for the responsibility of those in management or control. Um, and one of the other key things with that is in regards to um, providing information uh, to those parties who are in management control of a site or potentially become in management control of a site that's contaminated. So that's either on your site or off site. And I'll give you an example. Um, if you identify contamination on your site um, and you're a, a vendor looking to sell that property uh, and the person who is going to be purchasing that property is going to be coming into management control of that property, under the Act, it requires you to provide that information to that new uh, that purchaser. Um, if you are a landlord and you are leasing a property, it is exactly the same scenario. If you have information that you know there's contamination, you must pass that on to your leasee. You must pass that on to your tenant. Um, if you have information that, that indicates that there's potentially off-site contamination, again, you need, to, you need to communicate that to the person who is in management control of that off-site area if there's likely to be contamination off-site. And that is a significant change. And that's not the notification bit to EPA either. That's just, that's just managing and controlling contaminated land and responsibilities around providing information to those people who could potentially be affected by contaminated land. And we'll get to the notifying contaminated land in a minute. Um, there is quite a distinct difference between what is contaminated land and what is notifiable contaminated land. The notifiable contaminated land is when you need to notify the EPA. Uh, and that is, that is different to understanding if you've got contaminated land. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, if you're an industrial site, um, you have certain thresholds in terms of the NEPM, which is referenced under the regulations as to uh, whether a site is notifiable or not. If you are on industrial land, but you are, have got contaminated levels that are above uh, EILs and HILA, uh, for those who are not, not aware of that, HILA is the health investigation level under the, under the National Environment Protection measure around what is, uh, what is acceptable to, uh, from a risk perspective for people to be uh, using that, um, uh, that site. So if you have levels that are above that HILA, but are below your uh, HIL for the, the land use that you're using, um, then you still have contamination and the act still does come into play. So if you can, um, if you can just keep note of that, that's a really important one to, to recognise as part of your uh, responsibility under the Act. And that brings into play, if you do have contamination that's above the, the lowest threshold, then you do have contaminated land. And then those other aspects around informing parties such as tenants, purchases, um, sites next door, that all comes into play. Notifiable contaminated land is something quite separate. That's when your thresholds are above your current land use thresholds. So in other words, there's a potential risk to your current land use. Um, and potentially if there's a, if it's above thresholds for adjacent land uses, um, then that is a notifiable uh, contamination that needs to be notified to the EPA themselves. So there's quite a bit in that. Um, happy to field questions at the back end around that one, but um, quite a distinct uh, difference to the previous, the previous act. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, importantly, um, something that, that we all need to get our heads around to ensure that we're, we're compliant and discharging our duty. Just one other thing too with uh, that contaminated land piece is that this uh, managing contaminated land can be a shared responsibility. So if you're a landlord and you have a tenant on your site, uh, you still have a duty as a landlord, even though you're not actually occupying that site, um, you still have a duty under the Act to manage contaminated land. 
it will be proportionate. Uh, it will be proportionate on, um, uh, so the duty will be proportionate on how much uh, you're actually involved with that land. So obviously if you're uh, you know, leasing it out to someone who's operating a service station site, um, you know, and they are you know, predominantly in full control of the site, um, the duty really resides with the tenant on that site, but you still have some responsibility uh, under the uh, contaminated land management uh, aspect. So just something to bear in mind. So waste, that's the other key area for uh, change in this act. And it's something born out of, as I mentioned earlier, some significant incidents um, around Victoria, uh, including, and I won't mention names, certain businesses who were seen as being reputable um, and those businesses being infiltrated um, and some uh, fairly interesting practices that were occurring, which depressed the waste uh, market in terms of pricing across the entire <laughs> entire uh, nation, actually. And uh, so EPA are really pushing forward to uh, make those who are, who are recalcitrant around this space are criminally liable. Um, and that's a big change. So it's not saying that everyone will go to jail, but there is the potential to go to jail up to five years if you're criminally liable for uh, not... Uh, uh, complying with the duties around waste management. So that's quite a significant change. And as you can see by this slide that's up on, on the screen, the general environmental duty again, uh, umbrellas this entire process. The key change apart from that, uh, that, that criminal liability aspect is that it is, a, uh, it is a line and a duty of care that follows through the entire uh, process from the waste producer through to the waste receiver. Uh, just because you're a waste producer and you have then uh, had someone pick up the waste who you think is licensed to take that waste, um, your responsibility doesn't finish there. And I think that was something that most, most people perceived as, well, it's out of my hands, it's left the gate, it's gone into a, uh, into a licensed vehicle, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, that's no longer the case. There is a duty of care right through the process as a waste producer that you understand that that waste has got to a lawful place um, and it's got to a lawful place through a lawful waste transporter. Um, and uh, so there's, a, there's an, a responsibility there for the waste producer to understand and, and occasionally audit uh, would probably be a good term to use uh, that uh, the waste that's leaving the gate from your premises is actually making it to the lawful place um, to receive that waste. So importantly, there's sort of three key aspects here, which is the, the classification, the transport and lawful place. Um, and this is really designed to make sure that, um, um, you know, the, this waste is managed appropriately in Victoria. Um, there's a new waste tracker app that's uh, coming out from EPA. And, uh, and there's some clear uh, information around uh, classification of waste under uh, 1828. That's publication 1828, which, which supersedes um, both uh, publications 621 and 631. So waste classification, it, it falls into three buckets and, uh, and they can be a little bit confusing. So I'll quickly try and give you the, the headline position around uh, what those wastes are. Um, so we'll start off with in, industrial waste. And industrial waste really is where you've got waste that is surplus to requirements. So this is waste that it's on your property that you don't need anymore, um, but, it's, uh, but it may not necessarily be categorised as uh, something that's going to cause uh, potential harm. So it could be as simple as something like you've got some waste soil on site um, that uh, has been confirmed it doesn't have contamination. Um, so it's fill material, um, but it may have some bricks and some, and some rubble. So it would be an industrial waste and needs to be handled and received um, at a lawful place. Um, priority waste is something that basically has been prescribed as uh, under, the, under the Act and Regulations as something that um, is of higher hazard level to an industrial waste and reportable waste is, is that next level again. So a reportable priority waste could be, for example, um, contaminated soil. Uh, and that requires, uh, the difference between priority waste and reportable waste is that uh, reportable waste needs to go through that waste tracker system. Uh, 
uh, set up by EPA. So similar to the old four copy docket type scenario uh, that we had previously for movement of waste. So in terms of waste contaminated soils, um, there's the existing categories that we're all familiar with. Uh, the levels are, have been updated from 621 into to publication 1828. Um, and there are a couple of new categories in there. And um, that's category D, waste and soil, and also uh, contaminating asbestos only soil, um, or soil containing uh, asbestos only. Uh, so what does that mean? So category D soil is for those uh, project sites which, where there may be some surplus uh, soil that's, that's on the premises uh, that could potentially be used somewhere else within that premises uh, that has a lower contamination level than category C, uh, would have already ordinarily gone off as category C waste under the previous regulations. Uh, but under the new regulation, there is the opportunity to uh, get a permit uh, to effectively have that waste remain on site. Um, so that does require some engagement with EPA to, to allow for that waste to remain on site, but it does mean that you can, you can retain it uh, on site. Uh, asbestos containing soil only. So that's effectively saying that premises that uh, aren't necessarily able to receive category C waste, uh, can, but can receive asbestos waste, will be able to receive um, um, soil containing asbestos only. So in other words, it is film material from a chemical level, but it has that asbestos in it. So it, it trips into that, um, into that particular category. So just, uh, just to further to the points I've just made there around the surplus um, piece, I think there's a, there's a really new uh, aspect to waste that I think is, is quite worthwhile discussing today because it will affect um, uh, a number of sites. And that is the ability to have a declaration of use. Um, so as I talked about before, a reportable priority waste uh, is for, for, for waste such as contaminated soil. Um, so those are category uh, A, B, C, D, uh, and also asbestos uh, contaminated soil. Um, for soils that are under the field category, but potentially have some aesthetic issues, and let's, for example, say there might be some, some slight odour with, the, with the, the soil, but chemically it's okay, um, there may be an opportunity uh, to remove that soil, that waste soil as an industrial waste um, to a site that is able to receive that waste. And that could just be perhaps the site next door. Um, and I'll take, I'll give you an example. Um, if you're in, in an industrial area where one site's on a, you know, two sites together are on a slope, one site is looking to cut some material and another site would like to fill material, two separate parties, but the material itself, you wouldn't want to use that at a childcare centre because there's a bit of odour to it. It's in, from an industrial area. Uh, and But it's been uh, categorised as, as fill material in terms of the chemical constituents. But because of the aesthetic issues, uh, you wouldn't want to send that off to your local market garden or, or childcare centre for fill material. Um, there is the opportunity under this declaration of use, separate to any notification to EPA, for both those parties to review whether the, the material is like for like. So site next door for the site that's got the waste um, is very similar in terms of the, the soil components, the odour, et cetera. So there's no real difference there in terms of the soil. There is the ability to cut from one site and fill to the next site under that declaration of use, as an example. So that's something that's quite new for, uh, for waste soil. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, sort of close up today in regards to some key takeaways for the session. Um, there's a lot to it, as I said, uh, it's a lot of information out there. The EPA themselves have some fantastic resources and I'll, I'll provide some links to that in a minute. Um, but some key takeaways for today really are um, the ability to identify and assess and control your risks. That really is the key. The EPA are going to be looking for businesses to really have an understanding of their risks um, because there is a requirement there. Uh, you can't just bury your head in the sand anymore. 
Um, there is a requirement to, to know or should know about your hazards. Um, the state of knowledge is something that EPA are pushing very hard, that uh, the information is out there uh, to understand your, identify your hazards and, and be able to understand your risks. And that's through industry associations, EPA website, et cetera, uh, that uh, you, know, you really should be able to get a grasp of your risks uh, and uh, be able to control them. And that's and be able to document them and demonstrate to them when you have an authorised officer attend your property or your business. So that's really important. Uh, and that really fits under that uh, general environmental duty. Uh, but obviously the other duties that sit underneath that uh, all look to the same, um, same requirement. So as I said there, in that state of knowledge, it is really critical. That's the second point there around what you know or you should know. Um, and the other one really is in regards to making sure that you're communicating, training uh, and um, providing those persons who may be affected uh, with that information. And that's something that's very important. Um, and that's not just the, the notification to EPA, this is about you know, in, information around hazards um, and, and the risks associated with that, be it someone who's going to be coming on to your property as a principal contractor or, or a new tenant, um, or just an individual worker who's just, uh, you know, just started within your business, uh, who, who needs to be aware of those potential risks and understands how to mitigate them through appropriate training and supervision. So there's some key takeaways out of today. There's lots of other information. I've talked a lot um, around that, but there is a huge amount of information that is available uh, through EPA. EPA have done, a, I think, have done a really great job uh, in regards to providing information, I think in a fairly clear and logical way. Uh, what I've got up on the screen here is uh, just a, a QR code linked to EPA's understanding their new law. And the way they've structured their new website, because the previous one, as they self-professed, wasn't, wasn't ideal um, in terms of being able to find anything. Uh, they have provided a fairly, I think, a much better website uh, environment now and so i really encourage you to use that qr code uh, and or just jump on google and, and google uh, new laws environment protection authority victoria um, so there are references in the guidelines that epa are putting out uh, for uh, direction and support from both themselves but also from qualified consultants like green cap um, and I think it's something that, you know, from a business perspective, it's really good to understand yourself and where you can do those assessments yourself. Uh, I certainly strongly encourage you to do so um, because there's a lot you can do yourselves without the need for a suitably qualified consultant. But there are times when it gets to the next level um, that having that support will be necessary to really help discharge those duties and particularly you know, EPA are referencing that directly in terms of the need for qualified persons in their guidance themselves. So um, this is where we can help you guys out in developing risk assessment, uh, identification of hazards, risk assessment controls, classification of waste, incident response, um, management of soil and groundwater and, and site restoration and remediation. So um, I'll just put a little um, flow chart here on the bottom which provides a bit of an example of where, you know, if you are working on a site, you might find something that you weren't expecting. Um, and uh, a classic case would be simply uh, to stop works in that area, um, communicate, so inform the supervisor uh, immediately or your manager immediately of what, what's been identified, isolating that particular issue, um, implementing some temporary controls to make the area safe, and then seeking some advice from a suitably qualified consultant if you don't have that expertise in house. So I believe, Sarah, we have another poll to put up. Yes, you should be able to see that now. Thank you. Do we want to launch into some questions yet, or we just will wait yeah. for this? We do. There's a, there's a couple of polls, but I think, yeah, in the interest of time, let's let's launch into some of the, uh, the Q&A. Okay, so um, Paul asks if the building, or if building a new school, um, sorry, 
So here we are. So the first question is uh, from Paul. If building a new school and there are surrounding properties, do we have to notify all surrounding properties? How far do we have to notify? Yeah, that's a really great question, Paul. So first of all, um, in terms of uh, understanding uh, your responsibilities um, associated with either contaminated land or with noise, et cetera, there's obviously uh, council requirements around permitting for different aspects of building. Um, but uh, where you think you may have some impact uh, to offsite areas, um, that's, that's first of all assessing the hazard itself, whether it be dust uh, or noise, um, then putting in some uh, a risk assessment around that. So understanding your surrounding properties, is there potentially a risk to those surrounding properties? And then putting in some uh, mitigation and controls or mitigating controls in place. Um, so if those controls are in place, the, the need really to, um, for example, with dust, if, the, if those dust controls are in place, then in terms of notification, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not required. But the, the notification piece that I was talking about typically was associated with contaminated land. There's obviously courtesy as well. Um, if there is going to be potential impact with vehicles, et cetera, building a new school, then, then there's, there's an option to do so. Um, in terms of contaminated land, uh, yes, if you've got, uh, if, if during the process of, of getting uh, plans ready and some assessment of, of soil has been identified that uh, potentially is, is, uh, is an issue um, and uh, what well, an issue being that it is contaminated, it has, has satisfied the definition of contamination um, and that that contamination is potentially likely to be off site as well. Um, then there is definitely a, a requirement there to um, have a conversation with your neighbour um, and uh, and understand whether that Im impact has gone off site to and to investigate whether there's potential risk. Got one here from Stuart. Um, if you are made aware of contamination on land you do not own, but may be working on temporarily, i.e. public nature, nature strip, do you have to notify EPA? Okay, great question. So. Whose responsibility is it to notify EPA? Well, the notification, if there is already an, an awareness uh, of contamination of that land and you've been made aware by the landowner, um, the responsibility to notify does sit with the duty holder, which is the, um, the, the person who is in management control of that premises. And as, as I said before, Stuart, there's, there's shared responsibility around, um, around the, the actual management of contaminated land. So if you're only temporarily working there, the bulk of the responsibility does sit with um, the person who owns that property because you're only going to be on there you know, for a short period of time. Um, uh, as opposed to, uh, I mentioned before about a service station site. So as a tenant, you're there for an extended period of time. You're, you're conducting an activity that's potentially um, hazardous in regards to contaminating land. Uh, whereas the landlord in that case is, you know, a bit more arm's length. Um, and, uh, and so the responsibility proportionally would be more to do with the, with the service station operator than the landlord. Whereas in this particular scenario, uh, let's just say it's a public utility um, who owns the property and they are aware of the contamination and you're only going to be on there temporarily. Really, the responsibility to notify sits with the, duty hold, the, the, the main duty holder, which is the, the owner of the property, that utility provider. So hopefully that, that answers that one. Uh, I've got one from Lee here. Um, can you expand more on division of responsibility between landlord and tenant? Uh, hopefully I'll just uh, answer that for you. Um, also, is the position altered if the lease says the tenant is not responsible for existing contamination? Yeah, that's that's the commercial aspect um, that I guess you could, uh, you could write an exterior to the Act. But the Act is, is still fairly clear that um, the landlord um, at, or tenant still has uh, responsibilities uh, under management and control. So let's just uh, let's, let's take, for example, um, if you are the tenant and you are, uh, you are not undertaking activities that are potentially contaminating, um, then yes, the responsibility you still have a responsibility to manage that contamination because if you bring on someone to site, uh, let's say you've got a contractor who's going to be doing some digging, some disturbing of material um, that is contaminated, then you do have a responsibility to make sure that um, 
the, the risk of harm to human health or the environment um, is maintained, and that is a general environmental duty. So if you have a, someone coming on to site that potentially is digging something up and that soil is contaminated and that soil then we have a big downpour of rain and that washes off into the, the stream, then as a tenant, you are responsible for that activity. Um, now, in terms of residual contamination under the ground, for example, with groundwater um, that was caused by a previous activity on site that you're not contributing to, um, then yes, the management would be with, uh, with the landlord who is, who, who is already you know, knowing of that contamination um, and has that responsibility to manage that. So hopefully that provides a little bit of a, a definition between uh, when there's existing contamination that needs to be managed, uh, both by the tenant and the landlord, um, you know, in that particular circumstance. Ah, good question uh, from anonymous attendee. Uh, is there a grace period for businesses to implement the requirements under the new laws? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, the requirement is immediate, uh, but as I mentioned before, there will be a proportionate response. Um, so, if you if you are a business uh, and you've been operating as a business for a number of years, and you know that you've got uh, you know that you've got activities that were potentially contaminating, um, then doing the right thing under the previous act is is the same as the new act. Um, so you can't just say, "Oh, it's a new act." I, you know, I've got a grace period; I have to worry about managing my responsibility that I already already knew about previously. Uh, that is not the case. If you had a responsibility previously, uh, you'll have it. That will continue under the new Act. Uh, with regards to new duties that are, are quite new, um, then there is a there is a proportionality aspect to it. So you know, EPA understand that there is an education for businesses. So in terms of let's let's just say you've got ten sites um, and you haven't and you don't know uh, the contamination status for all of those. Um, and but you think that they may be contaminated, um, then you know there there would be uh, a requirement there for you to become a uh, understanding of that contamination, but not to have that understanding on the first day perhaps. Um, but but you have a program in place to to understand the risks associated with those properties moving forward. So if EPA knocked on your door on the first of July and said, "Hey, how many businesses you've got that might have issues?" And you say, well, I've got 10. And they ask you, have you done an assessment of that? And you say, no, but we have a plan in place to get that done. I think that would be acceptable. But again, I'm, I don't want to answer on behalf of EPA, absolutely, because they are the ultimate ones in determining that. But um, they, they have indicated, uh, as I mentioned in that, that statement of intent, it's a really good read. Check it out. It's on the EPA's website. It does provide some examples as to how they're going to um, approach this, particularly for different levels of business in terms of small, medium and large. So check that out. Uh, okay, if we have provided with a GA report from the client which does not indicate any contaminated soil, what is our obligation to confirm that the soil is not contaminated prior to or during excavation? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I mean, a GA report is quite specific in terms of what it's designed to do. Um, it's not an environmental contamination report and it's not intended to be that. But if you suspect that there's contamination on the site, um, then then you do have a general environmental duty um, to ensure that you've got controls in place that would allow for that contamination to be identified. And I put up that example of an unexpected find before, where if you find something that you weren't expecting, uh, whether it be asbestos or contaminated soil, whatever it might be there, um, that you do have a bit of a process in place to, to make sure you control that. Um, and things like, uh, okay, we're working on a service station site and we've got a geotech report. That's great. We've got a geotech report, but you're working on a service station site. Mm, yeah, probably going to be some contamination. So the responsibility is there for you to make sure that you have that, that those controls in place in readiness for that contamination or potential contamination, even if there's not a report to say that there is specifically contamination. There is an expectation from an EPA that you are working on a site that is potentially contaminated. So therefore you need to make sure you have controls in place to manage that. If you come across it, disturb it. And as I mentioned in one of the examples before, if you get a downpour of rain and it washes the contamination off into the stormwater, a bow, you're cooked basically, because um, you haven't um, considered the potential risks. 
um, is EPA publishing risk management guidance um, documentation related to the GED? Um, yes, as I mentioned before, they, are, they have provided guidance on what is deemed reasonably practicable. So go and check that out because that is really important. Um, they've also got, there's also a publication out there, um, 1695 around for, for businesses managing risk. It provides a really good tool. That's EPA publication 1695, um, managing risks for businesses. It's a great publication to have a look at. Um, it provides a really good template around a risk matrix and how to uh, identify hazards, risk controls, who to put uh, in management and, uh, and responsibility for those controls and information, implementation of those controls. It also provides an understanding of how to do a risk assessment, which is really good. Um, so yes, there is definitely risk guidance out there. Uh, okay, anonymous attendee. If a bin is on site uh, and there is plaster and building material in it, and it rains heavily, once the bin is collected and the water comes out uh, that is contaminated, uh, now do you need to notify the EPA? Okay, that's a really good question. So. Um, you wouldn't expect uh, just standard uh, construction and demolition waste, apart from asbestos uh, being in there, uh, to be uh, contaminating the, the, the water as such in terms of chemical contamination. Um, but there may be sediments. So it really comes down to, again, understanding, okay, well, um, if the bin's been collected and some comes out, um, you know, what... What, where's that water gone to? Has that actually been able to escape from the site? Um, and what does contamination mean? Is it just contaminated, you know, with just some, um, you know, just some plaster wash off? So it's, you know, there's a bit of coloration in there and there's also, um, you know, a bit of sediment. Then obviously that, if that goes to the stormwater, then that is, that is pollution. Um, so yeah, if it does get into the stormwater and, and it goes off site and it's white and it's just clouding the whole <laughs> the whole creek down the road, then yes, you would need to notify. Um, but if it's contained on site, uh, then no. If you're able to contain it on site, not a problem. Um, how does the new Victoria EPA Act compare to that of other states and territories? Yeah, look, that's a really great question. Um, Harmonisation is something that was very big focus for the OHS uh, acts around um, the country. And, and I think this Victorian Environment Protection Act really does to some degree harmonise with expectations, uh, you know, within other jurisdictions. There's definitely some nuances um, across the jurisdictions, but it certainly brings Victoria in line with a number of other jurisdictions, particularly around reporting. Um, and responsibility to, to manage. I think Victoria has probably gone that one step further um, in terms of being able to describe, um, you know, what is the requirement or what are your duties to manage um, risk and then how you can then um, satisfy those duties. And, you know, to contaminate land is a, is a classic one, but it's also around waste as well. Uh, now, New South Wales has sort of been, I guess, the the gold standard for some time in terms of the way they've, they've handled things. Um, but there's certainly other, as, you know, other jurisdictions like WA, um, particularly let's take, for example, underground petroleum storage tanks. That's something that, you know, there's a bit of variation, but typically across most states, there, there is a requirement um, to manage the chemical storage across your premises. Um, so Victoria is no different. It's got Dangerous Goods Act, OHS Act, that stipulates that. The, now there's a very clear requirement under the Victorian uh, act that you are preventing and, and you are in management control of your risks rather than just burying your head in the sand. And, and if you have a, uh, an incident, then you have to do something about it. That's not the case. It's really about understanding your risks, having that documented. So that really does bring Victoria, I guess, a step above um, perhaps some of the other jurisdictions. Um. Peter, we have that. Do you want to talk about the poll and then I'll put the other one up and then we finish off the other questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. So polls. Um, I've got just one here in front of me at the moment, Sarah. It's number one. Do you feel you would need some assistance in understanding what obligations the GED places on you and what actions you need to take? So 47% said, no, nope, I've got it, which is great. So that demonstrates the audience is quite well educated. Um, and that makes sense, being under my 22% um, were unsure, 
uh, and about 30% or there or 30, 32% were yes, really would need, need some help. So that's a good sort of cross section. It's um, yeah, it's there's a, there's a lot to, to take in, uh, but I think you know as a first port of call, uh, definitely have a look at the EPA website. Um, if you do get a bit muddled through it, we're definitely here to help you out. So feel free to give us a call. Happy to take questions, you know, brief questions, etc. Um, just generally around the new legislation, as I've been doing today, happy to do that on a phone call at any time, no problems. Okay, and the other poll is up. Um, just be, uh, if you're interested in future webinars that we could possibly do about the focused on different industries with the EPA Act. And there's a question in the chat for you, um, Peter. How, is it mainly for the industrial sites? Our major portfolio is retail and commercial. What action would you recommend in order to get to know if there are potential contamination under the building we are managing? Yeah, really good, really good question. So if you're a, a, basically a, a property manager and you've got buildings, I've got a situation uh, up in New South Wales where a property manager has got some underground storage tanks as part of uh, diesel generation uh, for the building. It's a very important building up there. So, you know, you can have issues on those. So it's, it is really important to understand your responsibilities around um, the potential for contaminating activities on your, on your properties underground storage uh, or chemical storage is, is a big one. Um, also waste management and waste management is another big one for, for properties as well to make sure that the waste that's being taken from your property is actually going to a lawful place. So I think if you're going to be looking at two aspects of the new environment legislation, it would be the contaminated land aspect. Do you have activities on your property, properties that will put you within your portfolio that potentially could cause contamination? or there's actually historical contamination on the site for your properties that wasn't, may not have been caused by the current activities that may have historically been there that would also require some management. So there's that aspect for contamin land and then there's the waste aspect, which is you know, your day-to-day -day operations. Um, are you generating waste? Now, so that's, that's for a non-industrial type site. For an industrial type site, you might have other things like you know, noise and, and other you know, air pollution activities elements as well. Okay, and there's one more anonymous question. What are the penalties for non-compliance and will they be, um, I think maybe tested or something in court? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but it's uh, it's gone up significantly. <laughs> so uh, I, won't, I don't want to misquote the EPA, but um, yes, EPA are very keen, as I mentioned right at the get-go of this presentation, they're very keen to mimic um, the way WorkSafe operate. Um, New South Wales, um, someone asked about the differences in jurisdiction. New South Wales have their own environment uh, court up there, so they definitely test it and they test it regularly. Uh, EPA is intending to test this in court, similar to how WorkSafe operate. So, you know, where there are some, some gross negligence um, or recalcitrant activities, they will definitely pursuing that. Um, they've made it very clear, particularly around the waste aspect, um, that those people who are, who are actually you know, knowingly um, you know, uh, avoiding their duties um, <clears throat> will potentially be criminally liable um, and facing um, significant fines as well as jail terms of up to, to five years. I can't remember what the fines are specifically, but they're significant. Okay, great. Um, there are... Uh, two links I've just put in the chat there. Um, one is to up and coming webinars, and the other one is again that green cap link with um, and on on that page there are links to the um, different EPA pages. So I think that's uh, one more question. Um, um, don't really understand that one, Peter. Something about no. a defence. No, that's okay. No. Okay. All right. All right. That's great. So um, we will send out that email later. Please check your spam because they sometimes land in there with the recordings and the links as well. And I'd like to thank, um, there's a lot of comments in the chat, Peter, great presentation. So thank you very much for joining us today and hopefully we'll get the Green Cap team back towards the sometime in the end of the year with a, maybe a follow-up webinar. That'd be great. Thanks. That's great. Look, thanks very much for your attendance today.
Uh, certainly plenty of information out there. So I, I, as I said, I encourage you to keep looking. There's lots more information coming through from EPA. So stay tuned. Hopefully you got something out of it and really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. See you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you next week. Bye.